This episode is brought to you by the Holistic Musician Academy, your home for 360-degree music mentorship, music, self-care, and artist development, curated by yours truly. Folks, you are in for such a treat. This is another instance of locking out big time with my guest list. And what's more, in this case, someone who's been such an enormous impactful figure in my artistic journey. There have been some people in my artistic journey who have been complete game changers. And John Matthias is definitely one of those people. The impact he's had on my thinking, on my approach to art, on my approach to life generally has been really, really game changing. I realize that's the kind of thing people usually tend to say on podcasts, sensationalize it, but I kid you not, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. That's all I'm going to leave you with. Once you listen to the conversation, I'm pretty sure you won't need a lot of time understanding how and why this gentleman impacted my artistic journey the way he did. And it's not just about name dropping. It's not just about the fact that this is the guy who played violins with Radiohead. This is the guy who collaborated with Tom York at a time a lot of people didn't know about him. This is the guy who heard the first version of Creep in his living room during a jam session from Tom York. Those are just the small little anecdotes which make this story interesting. But when you listen to this guy talk, you realize, wow, this is how I want to approach art. This is how I want to approach music. Or maybe that's just me. You decide for yourself. Before we go ahead, just a tiny little reminder. We are a completely independent show. And I'm doing this because I want to build an ecosystem of holistic, happy, badass artists. If that's something you want to support, here's how you can help. Go subscribe to us on the podcast platform of your choice. Share excerpts from this podcast on your social media. You know the drill. Help us out. Also, you'll be happy to know that for the first time, this is I'm experimenting with this, you can get your hands on the original raw recording, video recording of me and John talking. The episodes I usually release are heavily edited for multiple reasons, for context and so on. But in this case, me and John got really deep and really extended on some of his approaches with regards to physics and music, which I wasn't sure would be for everyone. So for those of you who qualify as the not everyone, there's a link on the episode and now let's go click that and then give you access to the entire unedited video. So without much further ado, please welcome my very dear friend and mentor, Dr. John Matthias. Hello fellow beings, welcome to the Tapasya Loading, a safe space to attempt honest, raw and authentic conversation homage to the ancient act of stoking a sacred fire. And we are officially on tape. Dr. John Matthias, welcome. Thank you very much, TL. An absolute honor and pleasure to have you on. You were my mentor during my master's degree. That's how we met. And it's been a game changer, something I've gone on the record to say as well. I uh, refer to my artistic uh, journey as a pre-John version and a post-John version. And I've also talked about how at the time I was on the fence with regards to rejoining academia in any form at the time. And um, uh, it was your uh, session, the first one we had, which changed my mind and eventually made the decision for me within 15 minutes. Is this something I told you about? I can't quite, quite recollect. Yes, you have. And I, I feel you have. I feel uh, very privileged that you, you think this. And um I think that academia has many forms across the world and in mm-hmm. different countries and in different colleges and different universities. So I'm really pleased that this form suited you. It doesn't suit everyone. It's a very artistic kind of critical thinking approach to music. So I'm really pleased that it fitted your, your outlook. It was your specific approach to the entire procedure which suited me at the end of the day, really, to be honest. I I still feel like I don't understand academia, which is ironic because I have four music degrees, but I feel like I still don't really get it. And a lot of times I'm not really sure what is demanded of me. Uh, But you gave me a a guideline which made sense. It kind of made sense in my world. It seemed like something that I could work with. Which brings me to my first question, if I may. You talk a lot about alignment in the artistic journey or the practitioner's journey. My guess would be that had a lot to do with uh, the way this whole thing panned out. Um, Do you remember when you consciously looked upon that concept, the whole concept of alignment as something as vital as you do? Yeah, it was taught to me by a professor at Plymouth University called Malcolm Miles, uh, who's a lovely man and very, very brilliant man. And he's not a professor, he's not an artist, he's a writer. But he 
took me aside when I was given my first PhD student <clears throat> and just said, John, um, let's have a chat. Mm -hmm. And then he explained the idea of thinking about a research context in anything that he did, whether it was composition, whether it was researching or getting interested in any subject. He talked about the importance of context and what that meant and drawing a boundary around context. And then he talked about posing some research questions around that context. And then he talked about questions just being questions that you want to find out about that context. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. Don't worry about, about, about it. Just think about what you are interested in, and, but also what the world can learn from these questions about this context. Mm. And then he described methodologies as just what you do or what you need to do in order to address those questions, very simply. Mm -hmm. And he said that as long as the methodology is aligned to the questions and the questions are aligned to the context, this project will make sense. Whether it's in composition, whether it's in engineering, whether it's in, in the humanities, whether it's anything to do with the arts, it will make sense. And I've, and, um, I've sort of taken that on board through all, a lot of my thinking. So the principle of them all aligning together and that also aligning with, with the world. So in terms mm -hmm. of academic, in terms of musical, commercial music context or music in the world, I think what, what I've found is that if what you do, and I, I, get, I get this wrong a lot, yeah. if what you've done isn't aligned to what the expectations or the context is, it, it's not going to work. I'll give you an example. So um, me and myself and Jay Alban, who's probably my principal musical collaborator, were invited by a very good friend um, called Andrew Graham Brown, who was a series producer. Mm -hmm. on on a natural history program called Gangs of Lima Island, okay? Mm -hmm. So this was a program about lemurs on Madagascar, and there were various different groups. And what they wanted to do was do a kind of meerkat manner on these lemurs mm -hmm. and make these lemurs interesting. And, and But it was very kind of mainstream media, right? And I got very excited about an artistic idea on this Gangs of Lemur Island program. Mm -hmm. And I decided it was West Side Story and that what was needed, the whole thing should be kind of thought about as a West Side Story gangland program. Huh. And so I convinced my friend, who was a series producer, to do this. And he kind of convinced the producer of the whole program. It was a very, very big budget program. Mm -hmm. But we didn't really ask her. And we didn't really kind of, we didn't really go into it and get her confidence. And she was interested in the idea and we, we did it. And we wrote some music that we were really proud of, proud of. And we called, we made this whole thing really West side story and it was great, but it wasn't what they wanted because what they wanted was a nice program on a Sunday afternoon for people in Wisconsin and Sheffield to just sit with their kids and, and listen. Oh, isn't that a lovely Lima? Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up being chucked off that program because we, it, there was no alignment. Mm -hmm. And however, however good we thought our idea was, and we were very keen on it, it didn't fly because we hadn't thought about that context and our alignment with the context. And, I, and that sounded a lot to me because I get very excited about things, but I've learned that, no, we should have gone, no, no, I'm not a natural history composer. I'm not going to go blub, 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 to a Lima moving. I should have just said no, but I didn't because I got excited about an advanced time. <laughs> That actually poses a really interesting question. Like, how do we define alignment? I mean, there's the internal alignment of the artist with their own views and the mm. external environment. Then there are industrial demands or, um, in your case, academic and demands as well and financial. So, yeah. And uh, at the time and similarly now, I, I would have really need, I need, really needed that job. I just left, um, Plymouth University. I was looking to try and make a living as a, as a composer. Mm hmm. And yet it was obvious that um, I could not make myself fit into what was needed at that time. So I think what I had since then is a, is a bit of a word with myself to go, you know, you, you can't just fit into, I just can't, cannot fit into that. I can only really do what really fits with myself in my own sort of integrity. So hence in terms of making a living, I love that. I like to combine teaching, which I, I really enjoy doing. It fits with my, my world, you, all my values, mm. and and then take on projects that I that I really feel and really need 
Brilliant. I get a lot of this question from um, the students and clients I work with. Is it too early to decide on what alignment means for an artist? Is there a level of maturity one needs to reach before drawing conclusions to that question? I don't know. I think that's a very good question because I, I also think that as a young mm. musician or emerging musician to use the kind of fancy new parlance, you should just try lots of things out. And you should do the gigs and you should go and do the thing and you should try lots of things and see what, what, what is you because people, people grow up at all mm-hmm. different rates, you know, um, and we don't quite know who we are and what we're into and, until a certain point, but there still is a balance to be struck. I don't think you should do, I don't think you should, you should do things that are very beyond your means and work for people that you disagree with politically, for mm-hmm. example, so on but i think you should try a lot of things out that would be my guess as well so it's a balance but is there a compass one can use to really make that call to know okay this is my core value and this these are the things i will not compromise on and hence use as a compass to make sure the rest of my environment qualifies as alignment that's i mean it's another really good question i think that um I think that it grows and changes. Mm. I mean, when I was a young musician, I played a lot of jazz. I played a lot of folk. I played, I wrote songs in a band. And and, and I have a very kind of pluralistic view to music. I don't have certain kinds Mm -hmm. of music that I play. And I still, I still do that kind of thing. So it wasn't kind of choosing a, a kind of music, but it, but I guess what happened is that gradually I found I found that I fitted into certain things that fit with me. And it's, it's, it's gradually, it's a two way fit, knowing what my limitations are, what my, what I'd like to do, what I'm going to get out of it, what excites me and what I really want mm. to do. I've always really loved the pluralistic approach you've taken to music. It was one of the things that I found very reassuring and comforting. I mean, yeah, I don't really know any other way, really. I mean, it, it's, it's, I think that things can get very stale if you just do one thing over and over again. I mean, you, you get you get it in the art world, you get it. And artists get labelled with a certain... I have a very dear friend who's a drummer called Tony Plato. And he had a very good friend who was a very mm. successful artist. And this artist made soap. He made work. I can't remember his name. But he made work out of soap and, and washing. Um, and he built beautiful sculptures of bathroom sinks and soaps and made lots mm. and lots of money. Adrian Bigot, his name is. Um, lovely guy as well, and very good artist. But he got sucked into doing the same thing over and over and over again in the washing thing, because that's what was demanded of him. Oh, well, yeah, we wanted to get some sinks, get Adrian in to do the sinks. Such an easy trap to fall for. I know, and there was another artist that taped around the edges of galleries and again and again and again. And it was beautiful. It was a lovely idea, but it was a one-liner. It didn't really have a lot of depth to it. I'm not talking about Hadrian here. I'm talking about mm. the taping person. But people say, "Oh, wouldn't it be great to have that guy in that does the taping?" And then you can't, then you're stuck. You know, you can't. You, it's very difficult then to jump out because they say you're the taping mm. guy. Aren't you? You're the guy that tapes. Or you're the guy that does the same. It is such a tough balance to strike, because especially yeah. all industry specialists will tell you niche down and find your thing and find your CI, your corporate identity and whatnot. Gosh. Meanwhile, the artist's mission feels like a complete opposite of what industry specialists will tell them, right? I'm, I'm constantly struggling with them. Yeah, I mean, if you, if, if I put a concert on, mm. right, or if I, people, are, people say, well, what about John Mathias? Well, he, he might be interested, or wouldn't it be good? And then they go, well, isn't he a sound artist or, or isn't he a violin expert? Isn't he a, he was a songwriter, wasn't he? Didn't he work with Cold Cut? Mm-hmm. There is a problem there because it's like they don't know who I am at that point. Now, I don't have a problem with that, but it does prevent me from finding an audience, if you like, because I think that the relation, one, one of the things that musicians need to do, particularly at the moment, is to find, find their mm-hmm. audience, connect with their audience. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's something that I haven't done very well for all kinds of reasons. And that, I think that's one of the reasons that people don't quite know which John Matthias they're getting, which is which is kind of fine by me intellectually, and but it isn't necessarily in terms of if I booked to do a gig or someone booked me to do a gig, it me it's not good. There yeah. aren't going to be two thousand people there. That's trouble because I haven't found that audience. I have two follow up questions to that. One: Why do you think this bias exists from the ecosystem or environment? And two. Why did you struggle as much to, for lack of a better term, niche down? I think it's interesting. I don't think it's a bias. I think it's 
I think it's just human nature. I think we are we are just quite simple, in, or the media that we've set up is quite simple, and we like things to be defined like this. Mm. I'm going to go and see this band. It's going to be like this. Do you want to come and see it? Hey, I'm going to this gig. What's, what, what are they like? I'm you know, going to get this. So if, you're, if you don't, if you're not simple to define, and then it's on who you can't easily describe. So I think it's partly that. And I think to answer the second question, I think it's partly because I've, I get excited by a certain thing and I get really into it and then I get excited by something else. And, then, and in my head, there will be a relation between them and, and it will be contextual. It will be who's who. There will be an opportunity. Perhaps someone will say, oh, you're interested in this. Or I will be talking to somebody, you know, for example, in that one, of the, one of the next projects I'm going to do is a violin and hurdy-gurdy album. Now, I would never have suggested, thought to myself that I would do that. And it's not, it's not like the world's crying out for a violin and hurdy-gurdy album. And it's, and it's not, it's not something that I think that, yeah, what we, what we really need is a, is a new violin and hurdy-gurdy album. But because my friend Jen Feiner is really interested in hurdy-gurdies. I have a confession to make. I don't know what a hurdy-gurdy is. Okay, that's a good question. So I'm, not, I'm no expert. I'm not the hurdy-gurdy player. Okay. But a hurdy-gurdy is an instrument, a very ancient medieval instrument. Oh, wow. European instrument. Played a lot in England in like 1200s, 1100s. Hmm. And it's, it's, it's got several strings, right, that go across it, made of wood. It looks very strange, like a big, weird, sculptured box, hmm. okay? And... And it's got a, 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 you make a drone by, by turning a wheel. So the bow, the equivalent of the bow is a wheel. And you, you turn the wheel with one and then it makes a drone and then you, and it's got a little keyboard on it that, that changes between the strings that, that stops the strings down a bit like a violin. Mm. You turn the wheel and you play it with your fingers and it sounds, it's, if you hear it, it's got a very particular a sound redolent of early medieval music up to wow. kind of Queen Elizabeth at that time. And Gem, released an album called Hurdy Gurdy. Um, this is Jem Fine, a collaborator on that record. And it's really beautiful. It's sort of mixed, a little bit processed. There's a little bit of electronics. It's very atmospheric. Oh, wow. And, and, he, and he contacted me and said, John, I think this would go well with Wiley. What do you reckon? And so that's often how projects start. But that, so that's a good example of something coming out of nowhere, but where we go, well, it's, it's certainly not economically driven. Mm. But it, it might be a beautiful thing. Should art be economically driven? It's a really good question. Um, I think that the, the bottom line is if you want to make a living as an artist, then you have to find an economic context. Mm. I think that, and I've written about this a few times, there's a really great podcast, as you know, TL, by, it's not a podcast, it's a, it's a TED talk by David Byrne. Mm, yeah. In that te TED talk, he, he talks about relationships between architecture and the music made in that architecture mm -hmm. it begins early on in the lecture talking about the music made in gothic cathedrals so let's take monteverdi's vespers for example they're beautifully long notes held by a choir it doesn't modulate mm -hmm. there's no dissonance really and it works brilliantly in that venue because the, the six second ten second reverb of a cathedral supports that music Wow. And then he takes us on a journey through Bach, who wrote his music in a less resonant church. Mm -hmm. So he could modulate a little bit. Mozart's music was typically played in rooms that had um, carpets on the walls. There was hardly any echo. So his music could be intricate. And he takes us through Wagner. Then he takes us to the MP3 player and modern music through via jazz and hip hop and MCing and all kinds. And so he talks about this venue being the content. Now, I think... I agree with David Byrne a lot. I think he's absolutely right. I, but I also think there's almost been a, a co-evolution. So the music has also influenced the architecture too. So it's not just a one way. Mm -hmm. As well as there being a co-evolution of music and the style of music with the venue or the architecture or the host, there's also a co-evolution of economic context. Oh, yeah. Where, where really the music does change with where the money is. Mm. And the money does change where the music is. So true. So in the 1990s, you know, people could sell records very, very easily. Mm -hmm. And they they made a lot of money selling vinyl records. Then they made a lot of money selling CDs. So there was an object-based economy. But as soon as streaming came along, that all fell off a cliff. And so the context has to change. And now, and when I talk to young students, all they want to do is get on a playlist. Yeah. And that's what they talk about. So for them... And you talk to a 21-year-old, they know a hell of a lot more about that than I do. I don't know anything. A whole different world. 
it is, and it's not something that they think about, but they have all sorts of algorithmic kind of, and they're taught, mm-hmm. there are modules in this. There are modules in getting on playlists. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's something that they take very, very seriously because that, that's a concept. So inevitably, because you want to make a living out of this, or there is a, there is a financial imperative, people want to be able to make money, then they're going to make the right music that's going to fit them on the playlist. And if your music sticks out and doesn't fit on the playlist, then you might not make as much money as if it does, which which is an imperative that a lot of musicians are serious about. Oh, so much good stuff in there. Um, so many questions that popped into my mind. For one, so we've established, yes, the economy plays a, a, a massive role in the actual manifestation of the art. But where does the artist find their place in that equation? Because most of us are pretty lost. I mean, that's a whole different topic. There are people who literally dedicate their lives to the subject of economics. Yeah. I think that so one, one of the things that I, uh, well, I haven't really succeeded in answering your question. No, we, I mean, we're just thinking out loud. Yeah. But, um, but I think what's happened is that there is a, to use that word again, there was a pluralism of economy. So one of them is the Spotify playlist, okay, mm-hmm. or the Apple Music playlist. Um, and then there are other ways of making money. There's the, there's the, the sync. So there's the synchronous, which is something you're essentially not in control of. Mm-hmm. And I think what I, what I've decided to do or to try to do in the last few years is to say, okay, well, there is a bunch of things that you're not in control of, like people syncing your music. So why not just try and take control of the things that you can? Absolutely. So I have been trying to play music more live and to find an audience. So I released an album. I did a session. So, so this year, in the last 12 months, I've been part of release of four, four albums. So it's been very busy on the kind of release front. Oh, wow. Awesome. Congrats. Thank you. It's been very exciting. And they're all very different kind of projects. Mm-hmm. And one of them arose because, so Jay Orban and myself released an album called Ghost Notes in April. I can talk about that in a minute if you like. But on the Ghost Notes session, we, um, we had a string quartet come and play, um, that play on the track No Parable and beautifully, play really beautifully. They're a Bristol based quartet, part of the Bristol Ensemble. And, um, and there was this man who was about the same age as me. He had a flat cap on. He was funny. He made me laugh. He took this a bit which was funny. Mm. And I just sort of said to him, can you improvise? Because lots of classical musicians aren't comfortable with improvisation. Right. And he said, yeah, I can improvise. And I said, do you want to have a jam then? And he went, sure. And that became this thing called two violins. Mm -hmm. One of the things I wanted to do was, firstly, I wanted to, I've done lots and lots of technological projects and I wanted to do a project that was without technology, essentially, which was just, you just turn up and you play. I really like resonance acoustics. I like the sound of violins in resonance acoustics. Mm. You don't need an amplifier. You don't need a sound engineer. You just walk up. And he was a he's a brilliant violinist. And he comes from a, diff- a complementary world to me. He's, he's a conservatoire trained musician. He's played in the London Symphony Orchestra and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Brilliant. He's done those sessions in, Ab- in Abbey Road. And I'm not. I, I, I learned the violin at school, played in the County Youth Orchestra, went and did different subject at university and just played around in bands and learn on the fly kind of thing. Mm. And and you can hear the difference in the two violins, but it works perfectly. And, and what we wanted to do was oh, try... May, may I ask you, sorry to butt in, may I ask you what you think yeah. the differences are? I'd be super curious. Well, my violin was found in my grandma's house after she died. So she died when I was five in Nottingham. Uh-huh. We went to clear her house out the door and there it was, everything. And we had to take everything out. And I remember as a five-year-old, at the back of the room, there was this violin in a black wooden case. Mm-hmm. And I think someone said, oh, you, you can might be able to play this one day, John. And I was obviously kind of resonated with me because when, when I was eight years old and someone came around the class and said, does anyone want to have violin lessons? I stuck, stuck my hand up. And they did a test on us to see whether we could tell whether this note was higher than that note. I could, I passed the test. And there I was in a group of four with a teacher called Miss Chivers, Nancy Jo Chivers. Mm-hmm. And she taught us, she was a cellist, a really good cellist. Um, she taught us the violin. And, and, and I ended up playing this violin. And the violin that I play now is the same violin that we found in my grandma's room house after she died mm. and it's a victorian ladies violin it's not a it's not a full size instrument wow um seven eights so the, it, it was made in germany in 1850 ish probably mm-hmm. <clears throat> they thought that ladies needed slightly smaller violins so they, they made them slightly smaller interesting most of the ladies i know here are all taller than me <laughs> that's true <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, I never thought about <laughs> that. On a side note, so maybe, it was for the English, maybe it was for the English market. No, that means maybe I have heard thing. that uh, an earlier generation in Germany were a lot smaller in size. But sorry, not to get Is off topic true? here, but just thinking out. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> who'd have thought we'd be talking about the size of German lady? <laughs> yeah. So my violin, but it does sound. Um, at this Declan, Declan says it sounds very good down low. But it doesn't have that very high up. It doesn't have the sonority that you'd expect from an expensive violin. Mm. Declan has a proper expensive violin, and you can hear the, you can hear the difference down. I think down low, but up on in sound, both sound kind of sonorous. I mean, maybe mine's a little bit sonorous. Is but up high, where you're playing, and this is another contextual thing. If you're playing in an orchestra, if you're in the London Symphony Orchestra, there's a lot, and you're on the first violin, you have to play a lot up high. And you need it to sing and zing if you're playing those concertos because that music is written with these expensive violins. Mm. Um, whereas mine, my, my grandma's auntie who, who played this violin, her husband was a policeman, apparently. They used to play in bars and they used to go to bars and clubs and rock up. Nice. It's rather sad because the, the sad part of that is my dad was in the car, in the car park, reading books while listening to the music because he wasn't allowed in the pub. Huh. What was that? Well, it would have been in Nottingham in 1950s, 1940s, 1950s. And your kids weren't allowed in bars, oh, you know. Oh, okay. But, but, and you can hear the difference in improvisation as well. So my improvisation is a bit more raw and a bit more less informed by classical playing. And Declan has these classical affordances because he, he has a slightly different way thinking about playing the violin than I did. You just helped me drive into another topic I really want to pick your brain on, which is the early years. Just for my audiences, by the way, uh, John is extraordinarily humble because um, the way he just talks about his career, he doesn't do it justice. His career is actually pretty incredible and the kind of thing uh, most of us would be very proud to have, which is why I'm very curious how this very unconventional combination of um, you being this super futuristic experimental musician who collaborates with uh, some of the finest names in the British independent music industry. And you also have this very unconventional academic career. You're, you have a doctorate in physics. How did these parallel careers come together or happen together? How does one even do that? It's like two... Thank you for your kind words. I did a degree in theoretical physics uh -huh. at Exeter University in, in, in England. And and then I subsequently did... I, 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 took a, I took a year off. And in that year off, I worked as a physicist at TEC studying noise and traffic flow systems. We made a model of traffic and tried to understand how it fluctuated down motorways. Hmm. And then in the same year, I organized a contemporary music festival with my friend Shaq. So that would have been 1991. In that music festival, we, Shaq and I, we wrote this piece called Flicker Noise. Just to quickly explain that in 30 seconds, hmm. um, noise is, it means a fluctuation in a signal, okay? Most signals, natural signals, fluctuate. And one way to find out and characterize that fluctuation is to find out what the frequencies are in that signal, okay? So the French mathematician Fourier mm -hmm. um, found that every single natural signal, every single signal can be broken down into its mm. different frequencies. So a graphic equalizer does that, finds its frequencies. So a sine wave, a single wave with one frequency would have just one spike as a Fourier as its Fourier spectrum. Okay, so that's the relationship between a sine wave and a, and a spike. Two sine waves beating together would have two two spikes on a on a, as a Fourier system. Now white noise, which most people have heard of, which sounds if you if you listen to it, it sounds like a, a, a fuzz, right? Mm -hmm. White noise is defined as a signal which has every single frequency contributing equally. Mm -hmm. So if you looked at its Fourier spectrum, it would be a straight line, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> flicker noise, or 1 over F noise, is like white noise, but instead of being completely flat, it goes higher and higher and at low frequencies. And in mathematical terms, the, the, the power spectrum of the noise, the, the amplitude squared, goes as 1 over the frequency. Now, it turns out that loads and loads of natural systems have... Are one over F noise. So if you measure the fluctuations and the luminosities of stars, it's a one over F noise signal. If you measure the, num the, the amount of water running down a window, a, a car, and dripping off the end, 
and you measure the current of water coming up to one over a noise signal. If you measure a lot of noise coming off a diode, an electronic diode, that's also one over F noise wow. spectrum. So there's been a lot of interest in this amongst theoretical businesses because we're always looking for universals. We're always looking for universal things in natural systems that might tell us something underlying about what the world or the universe is doing. And so mm-hmm. I was very privileged to work <clears throat> as a 21-year-old with these two brilliant... You were 21? Wow, the water needs to work on something like this. I have a free gift for you, my friend. No strings attached, legit free gift. What if you could have your entire career as an independent musician presented to you on one page? All of the aspects you needed to be aware of, starting from creativity to collaboration, stuff most musicians are a little less privy to, like PR, other aspects of music business, down to self-care, and a very lucid display of how all of these elements are interlinked. What if you could have one page which gave you an overview on all of that? I can give you that page and it's up for a completely free download. Please go check the episode notes. You'll find the link there. One page, an entire overview of an independent musician's career. And in case you're wondering why I'm doing this, I want to build an ecosystem of holistic, happy musicians. Musicians and artists who are building their careers in a fulfilling manner on their own terms. So, if this is something that resonates with you, go download the Artist Roadmap. Yeah, I was 21. i just done a degree. I'd finished my first degree in theoretical physics. And one of the professors, Roy Sambors, who was a brilliant man, um, he's still alive actually, called me in a corridor and said, John, I've been thinking about you. Do you want to work at GEC over the summer? I was like, whoa. It was like, that is a problem. Something to do with traffic flow. Anyway, I think it'll be good for you. So um, I booked for you to go and be interviewed next Wednesday. So I was like, all right. <laughs> so I went with him on the train. And it was one of the most extraordinary train journeys I've ever had. Because he kept testing me and testing me and testing me and testing me all the way on the train. He'd, he'd do word tests. He'd do, he'd do huh. points of clouds and say, why did, why's the light going like that? Um, have you thought about this? What's going on there? And then he'd say, can you think of a four-letter word in E-M-Y? And I'd go, no, 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 no. Amy, Amy, Beany, Danny, no, no. And then he'd go, deny. You missed it. And then there'd be another question. And there'd be another question. Wow. Um, I was exhausted by the time I got to London. I was interviewed by these two men who I ended up working with, um, Paul Bresloff and Mike Carney. And it became really clear very early on that they weren't really interested in what GC wanted from them. They wanted to do really pure theoretical physics. And they told me about 1 over F noise. And they told me that two physicists, um, Musha and Higuchi, mm-hmm. had stood on a bridge in Japan. And they just measured the number of cars going past under this bridge and how it changed with time. And then they took the Fourier transform of this signal and then they squared it and they found it was a 1 over F. So... He, they said, do you want to, are you interested in this? I was like, yeah. So we spent the next six months playing around with models of traffic and trying to work out whether we could do it. And we didn't solve the problem. But it turned out we got somewhere near to solving the problem. And I, I realized with them that the best way of measuring cars on a, on a road is not by, it's not by having dots as cars and writing a model about who's in front of the dot and can you move into the next. It's by thinking of traffic as a way. So if traffic is a, is a relatively high density cars per unit road, it turns out that you can use something called the Light Hill Whitam model of traffic flow, and where you have a density of cars um, as the main variable hmm. along the road and, and distance. And if you randomly start these differential equations of the Light Hill Whitam model and then let it go, it turns out you get one over F noise in the in the number of cars flowing along that road, that motorway. So I think about this a lot, where the traffic jams are, which is actually an analogy of a shock wave in a, in, a, in, a, in a wave system. Wow. So, yeah, so that's what, that was my kind of introduction to that. But then, but then you know, finishing that, I, re- I read a paper during that summer um, by Dawson Clark, which was about modelling 1 over F noise and, use, and how you could make an algorithm of numbers. Mm-hmm. And... We got quite interested in John Cage at, in, in the university and the idea of randomness and triggering music from random signals. 
and I thought with this friend Shaq, who's Simon Shaq, and that we could write a piece together using these numbers. So we started off with a very serialist a- approach, where I put this algorithm into a computer, came over with a lot of numbers. Because the point is that whenever F noise is more correlated than white noise, because it's a power law, F to the minus one, one over F, it means that there's a self-similarity. It's, it's also called a fractal noise. So it's related to the science of fractals. Wow. Fractals are based on a power law. You have self-similarity if you have power laws, mm. for example. So we started off by the first, I think you can see this on YouTube, actually. If you, if you Google flicker noise, John Matthias and Simon Shackleton, you'll probably find it. I think it, it's a kind of curious one. But um, I think people Google it because Tom was um, singing at one point. Tom York from Radiohead. Um, was was in was in it and sang behind a curtain at one point. What well, he was part of this project? Yes, he was. Yeah, he performed. Small detail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he came in the last. So, so yeah, the reason that we got him here was mm-hmm. well, he's an extraordinary singer, as you know, and musician. But what we did was we, we the first of the first we were, every single thing in the music was based on the numbers, including the notes, the duration of the notes, and so on. So it's a very sort of serialist approach. Mm-hmm. And then we took away each of those restrictions in the subsequent movement. So in the second movement, we might have taken away the duration thing or the or the pitch thing or the and then by the by the fourth or fifth movement, we, it's through composed but being influenced by what we'd done before. Wow. And so Tom Ang, <clears throat> a melody that we wrote with him for the final movement. So in a way, even then in nineteen ninety one I had a, a mindset where I was playing with compositional approaches along with scientific theoretical approaches. Were you aware of how unique an approach that was at the time? No, it felt very natural. I know, right? No, yeah. I didn't. It, no, it, it didn't. It didn't. I, because, I mean, I guess I sort of read a lot of stuff about those kinds of things and, and it, it felt like a small community and not, not a real live community because we didn't have the internet then in the same way. That's the unnatural approach to things. One could argue. I mean... We spend years honing a craft and then try get in line to get on a playlist on an app, hoping someone's going to take a minute to listen to the music. That is, That doesn't sound like any form of justice to the amount of work that actually goes into the making of a piece of music. Yeah, but nobody cares about justice. I mean, it's not, you're assuming that there is, there is justice. I, and I think, that, I think that my response to that would be, if you're just going to worry about whether you're going to be on a playlist, then you, it's a hiding to nothing, really. Thank you for saying that. Because I just think you're just not in control. You're waiting for other people to make decisions for you and you're fitting in with everything else. So if everybody just fits in with everybody else, then it, it's, gonna, it's going to be very bland, isn't it? Thank you so much for saying that. So what do we do? What, what, what do you recommend as the approach? I'm not sitting here with the answer, but I think that we have to find our audience. Yes. By finding our audience, I think what it means is it's, it's, it's thinking about musical communities in a kind of holistic way. Yes. So, for example, with Declan, what we do is we we organise our own concerts. Usually, mm-hmm. we put it on on a, on a ticketing platform, and then we try. We're not very good at doing this, but we we promote it ourselves, mm-hmm. and then you know, and we'll we'll get our audience, and then we'll turn up and play. So we're in control of all of that. Beautiful. Now we might not make an awful lot of money out of it, but it it probably gets us. It, it does enough for us for that night, but it's very gratifying because. We're in charge of the music. We just turn up. We're in charge of the audience. We're in charge of the ticketing. We don't have to drive very far. Mm-hmm. We know where we're going to play. We build relationships with these churches, not in a religious way, but in a community kind of way. And mm-hmm. I think that that community space really fits in with, with, with the way in which musicians could think about themselves. So, for example, in Bristol, where I teach um, a lot, there's a drum and bass community, and then there's a 140 community. And there's a, I was talking to a student yesterday about this, there's a, there's now a kind of MC grime clash community. Wow. But really in these cases, it's about finding the audience, finding, you know, now apparently that lots of lots of people want to go to concerts that are in the round and lots of DJs want to be in the centre, like a gladiator in a coliseum where the audience is around them, which to me says sort of DJ as God rather than DJ as as anonymous mm-hmm. selector. Hmm. James Gibson was a um, was an ecologist. And he wrote a book in 
in the early 70s, 1972, I think, called The Theory of Visual Perception. I think Psychology of Visual Perception or something like that. Uh-huh. But there's a beautiful chapter right in the middle of it. It's quite short. There's nothing to do with vision. It's just called Theory of Affordance. And the Theory of Affordance, is, according to James Gibson in Ecology, really says that it's talking about animals and their niches, really. Mm-hmm. So it talks about, say, a pond's... A, the surface of a, of, a, of a lake or a pond affords the pond skater something to to skate on because of the meniscus and because of the surface tension. Mm. A cave affords safety mm. for an animal to be in. A hard floor affords stand on ability. A chair affords sit down ability. And he builds this beautiful and he uses those language at those words, which was very unusual in an academic book. Him. Mm-hmm. 1972, to build a theory that certain niches afford animals certain things and then we fit into those things. And now I think there are two ways in which this idea fits in with music. One is musical instruments afford certain things. So the violin affords the ability to pluck, it affords the ability to bow, mm-hmm. it affords the ability to make harmonics, to, to fret fingers without frets in certain way and that and the sound of the violin, this fits in with my physics sort of background as well. Mm-hmm. It affords all these different sounds that you can make. And you can apply that to any, every single instrument. Mm-hmm. You know, the hurdy-gurdy, as we talked about earlier, affords this, this drone thing because of its, the mechanism of the wheel. Piano affords all sorts of kinds of things, like playing lots of notes at once and doing things like taking it out and pressing the pedal, and that affords a different kind of sound, and that builds up the sound of piano. But it also fits in for me with... David Byrne's idea and the contextual idea through niches, because I believe that certain communities in music are a bit like ecological niches in, in the Gibsonian sense, mm. such that if you if you are um, in the drum and bass kind of community in Bristol, you know you, it, it affords this kind of music, and you you make connections with with people who are doing this thing and build up a community, and that is a kind of niche which affords this kind of music, and we can apply that. We can apply that to, to, you know, the jazz, the South Asian jazz piano scene or the, or the Hong Kong particular scene. And it, it's the same with teaching. So I, I have a, I've been quite influenced by this idea of affordances recently in terms of thinking about those communities. So I think to go back to the question that you ask, if we can find those communities and find the affordances that link our abilities and our interests with, with a certain community, then I think you can find economies like that which you which you then mm. by by kind of definition almost in control of beautiful i have one one last question in, in context to this before i, I want to dig in a little more into the uh, your musical journey do you think artists should think of themselves as businesses i don't know i don't know whether i'd want to say what anybody should think of themselves at, um as i love that answer i think it really depends on what you want to do and, and if you are going to think about yourself as a business then that's fine mm-hmm. but but then you have to decide what this business is going to be and whether it's going to be something is just about making money and if that how they're going to make money and what's it going to do and how it relates to you as an artist making things mm-hmm. um i remember um quotes resonating in my head for some reason i remember talking to decorator once someone was painting and someone was saying to this decorator, it was a bunch of music, musicians, sounds like a joke, but it isn't, and this decorator, and then, and then they said, someone said to the decorator, and I was there, why do you, how can you make so much money decorating? Why do you charge so much money? Hmm. Same money, though. Know? I've got to buy paint. I've got to spend all this time working. Mm. Um, and I'll never have a hit. Mm. And that, I really liked that. He said, I'm never going to have a hit house. I'm never going to have a hit thing, but you guys, you know, you might have a hit record. So there's a difference between that kind of like suddenly, you know, so he has to think about himself as a, as a sustainable business. Mm. And that also is the problem because there is a phrase for carrying on doing something in the expectation that you will be incredibly successful at one of these tries. And Mm. it's a psychological, it's an addictive psychological phrase called something like something, something intermittent reward. Which basically means that you try, you do it, and you do it again, you do it again, and you do it again, and most of the time it doesn't, it fails, and then every now and again you get a really, you get a payback, like you might get a decent PRS check, or you might get a, a decent job, or somebody suddenly gives you five thousand pounds for doing something, 
But then you go back to doing it again. And apparently in psychological terms, it's one of the most addictive mm -hmm. cultures. It's one of the most addictive things that you can have. And that really is a correct description of most people's musical lives, I think. I, I, I can't let you go without asking this question in response. How do we define failure as artists? Oh, I meant economic failure. But, okay, cool. um, okay. But the, okay, fair play. You know, a, a non-economic non success. But there's lots of different ways of being successful. And I wouldn't use the economic one as the main driver of that, you know, mm -hmm. whether it fulfilled you, whether it was beautiful, whether people liked it, so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. Super helpful. Thanks, John. I'm, I'm going to rewind a little back to your musical journey now. Um, the pluralistic approach and how you feel that's always complicated the procession of your music for certain audiences. You and I are both fans of Miles, Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. How do you think someone like him got, got away with it? Mm, that's a good question. I think he had such a complicated life and he was such, he's such an outlier in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, I think he just kept sacking musicians until he found the right sound and then stayed with them if they got the right sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the behind the scenes part, but even the, the manner in which he would make successful records and, success, and after like even hitting rock bottom multiple times. Do you think it was also the sidegeist? Yeah, I, th I think he was on a book a lot about change being the thing that you needed to be aware of yeah and although i think he was a very difficult man and had lots of very difficult relationships mm -hmm. he did have certain relationships that stayed like one with gil evans for example mm -hmm. and um tear macero and he he had fleeting relationships with very very good musicians but i think he had he realized that things had to change mm -hmm. and that i think he understood that the jazz the sweeping jazz for example that's 20 30 supporters and even bebop once it became a thing and froze then it doesn't move, and then it then it just it's just like being in a museum. I think the last thing he wanted to be in was be in a frozen a frozen genre. You know, we we if you go to most jazz in the UK now, it'll be hard bop essentially mm. um, or trad jazz. These aren't progressive music, and he wanted to be progressive. He wanted to be mm -hmm. to, to find a new music, if you like. And I think that's what kept him going. But I mean, he was extraordinary musical. He knew how to control moments and how to control moments with a group yeah. of musicians. Yeah. Do you think you'd get away with it in today's music industry? Yeah, I, 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 I would. I'm, I'm certain that he would. Yeah, he would have found a thing, Me too. found a way. Yeah. Yeah. I think Mozart would have done, I think. So would, you know, I think these, the, 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 the very, very, very good, very brilliant people, they have, but they just have this antenna. They, they just know. They also have the antenna for knowing what's going to resonate with an audience too. Do you think that's something people can train? It's a really good question. Well, Tom York has it. Yeah. He, he knows and always has known, as well as being brilliant and and having a lot of artistic integrity, he has this thing that I don't really have, which is really knowing what what's going to work then. And he, it's like having a cultural antenna in. Mm. And, and a lot of the people, you know, the people who have been very successful commercially, do have that. Noel Gallagher has it. Björk has it. Mm. it. Even though Björk is, it does pretty much does what she wants. She also knows how, knows that it resonates or, or knows how to resonate with an audience. The question I find myself asking all the time is how much does the individual mind, the fundamental mindset of an artist play a role in that? If I start kind of make a deal with myself and I'm getting a little, I don't know, ooh, here, just, okay, I will figure out a way to take my music to my audiences and find my audiences, but I have to make sure I found my music first or built that sound, which I really believe in. I feel like so many artists just forget that first step in the first place. Well, that presupposes that one comes before the other. I see more of it as ah, a, as yeah. a, yeah, as a, as a, as a, as a dynamic. So you might have some idea of who you are, but I think you need to bring the audience with you and then you, develop that with an audience mm. and then then it, it's a more larger system than the one that you think it is do you think we reflect each other do you think artists and audiences reflect each other oh, yeah i think you need i think they need each other it's it's a complex system of interdependence so and, and if and if one is forgotten about it won't it won't work i mean I, I, but having said that i don't think there's anything wrong with just playing music on your own in your in your own shed and no, not at all. writing what you want to if you don't want to yeah, with the public. No, but, you didn't um, sound like you were you saying do, that. Yeah, you need to find your audience and bring them with you in some way. How that is has changed a lot and, and, and is changing a lot at the moment with all kinds of electronic processes and distributed people and distributed cultures and not 
multiple genres and multiple communities. It, it's an extremely complex situation. Now, what question, what is a musical community is, has a very complex answer. Thank you. Sorry, I keep going off on these tangents, on these abstract um, questions. They're just, it's, it's just, a, um, I'm totally exploiting your uh, time now because uh, it's, it's just <laughs> so tempting to um, pick your brain on these abstract topics. Would you tell us a little about your um, um, association with Tom York and Radiohead? You've you've had a, a long relationship with him. You've collaborated. He's done remixes of your music. You go back, don't you? Yes, we, we first were in a band together um, at university. So it's the same person I talked about, Shaq. So I mean, Shaq Patel came up to me in a canteen queue at university and said, we found this, we found this first year. He's amazing. <laughs> Um, we're going to form a band. It's going to be called the Headless Chickens. Are you in? <laughs> Headless Chickens, love it. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Of course I'm in. And um, and so we were in this band. It was called the Headless Chickens, and um, it was just a party band, really. So we turn up, we we rehearse, one play, write some songs. Well, Tom Tom wrote some songs, Shaq wrote some songs, and then we just turn up, we play a gig at, part, at someone's party. Some of these parties were sort of in on Dartmoor because it actually actually near a national park called Dartmoor National Park and some students lived on weird farms in the middle of nowhere. We played in the the, the university kind of uh, hall, which is called the Lemon Grove, still is called the Lemon Grove. Mm-hmm. But it was great fun and it was a great band. It changed personnel a few times. But um, then we we were in a band called Flicker Noise, named after the one over F Noise that I was talking about earlier. And um, Tom... Uh, ended up leaving that band because he he wanted to be in his band at home, mm-hmm. which is called On a Friday at the time. And then On a Friday got signed to EMI. And they asked them to change their name, so they changed it to Radiohead. Oh, and then so that's how Radiohead was born. Yeah, they were called Shindig, and they were called On a Friday, and they were called Gravitate. At one point, they had a brass section at one point in Oxford. Amazing. And and then what happened was they I, I didn't I my I was living with my friend Alec at the time. Mm-hmm. And me and Alec used to go to, to their gigs all the time. And they were amazing. I remember once seeing them in the Lemon Grove at one of these, a student ball. And they came on about two o'clock in the morning. There was nobody there. They were like, it was maybe two people in the audience, including me. Wow. And I just stood and watched them. And they gave absolutely everything yes, in this performance. That's the thing. And they were absolutely astonishingly good. That's the one. And I was completely blown away. And then they came off. Oh, hi, John. And then they got a drink. Um, and and that, that was whilst they were signed to EMI. Wow. Um, and then Alec, I went to loads and loads of gigs, but I didn't have any, I didn't have a musical relationship in then until I think after their first record, their first record had creep on it and, and was a sort of commercial success through their record company as a result of that, I think. And there's all sorts of things written about, about why that happened and how that happened and how it became successful through a, I think it was a TV, American TV host, but I don't know the details about that. Um, but then I think what happened was that they realised that the band and the managers realised that they needed to form their own community in a, in, in a way in which I've been sort of talking about, really. Mm. Rather than relying on EMI to do stuff for them, they realised that they were had power to be themselves. So they decided, rather than to get uh, the London String Group in, to get me in to play violin on the band. Awesome. Uh, a brilliant session musician called Caroline Lavelle to play the cello. Mm-hmm. But that was really privileged, you know. I think I don't think Tom really stuck his neck out and said, "I want, I want my friend John to do this." I don't want this because I think, I think he, I think he's the right person. Brilliant. And they, they wanted um, Stanley Donwood, their friend, our friend from university, to come and do the, the artwork with Tom. And gradually, I think that that worked. And so Stanley Donwood has done all of their artwork with with Tom, and now they 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 work a lot artistically together. And gradually, they took control. So then, so I had the privilege of playing all the strings on. The violin and viola parts on on the bends, which feature on fake plastic trees and nice dream, and and I, and that was an incredible formative experience for me because the music's amazing. It's beautiful music, and and the the, the parts which Johnny and Tom wrote were really really musical. It had this, they're incredible, beautiful. May I interrupt you for a second, John? Just a quick question, just to check in. Yeah. Are you interested in going live on Instagram? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm up for doing that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's do it then. So I'll go live. I've added you as a moderator. There you are. Did you know you're going to make the kind of history um, you were making when you played on those records? 
but we're talking about the bands by Radiohead. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what, what is meant by making history, really. I think we just do what we do and then carry on doing what we want to do if we're lucky enough to be able to do it. Well, that speaks for your artistic integrity, I would say. Just goes to show you would probably do your thing no matter what you think you're getting yourself into. I don't really see that as making any more history than, say, some of the other music that I've made that nobody's heard. But I think that it felt at the time that that music was really special. Yeah? So it, you or, felt that? Yeah, and in the studio... Listening to them, Tom sent me a tape, cassette tape of, of the track before we did it. And, 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 and I loved it. I, 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 I did think these songs are really special. Um, mm. So there was, a, there was a definitely a sense of, of this music having a, a real yeah, feeling around it. Mm. It knew what it was. I mean, I like music that knows what it is. And that, that record knows what it's doing. May I request you to elaborate a little on that, please? How, how do you know when the record is n- knows what they're doing? No, it's not that you know, it's that it knows. I think that, I mean, mm. I, 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 if I'm working with students or, or listening to music that I, that I like, it's, it knows what it's doing. Um, it's got the confidence to, to know. Even if, it's, even if it's non-confident music, you can still tell whether the music works within its own self. And I don't mean fitting into genres, I just mean it just knows. So it's a phrase that David Pryor taught me. David Pryor's a friend who I was in a band with called Derailer, and he, and he, he uses a lot of this phrase, yeah, he knows what it is. And I, I like it. It makes sense to me. Knows what it is. I love it. So it's basically about its music having its own internal integrity, if you like. Oh, I love the sound of that. I love that idea. The Benz is really unusual, I think, because, um, you know, you've got... That they are a very, very, very powerful live band. And I, I don't think it's that well known how powerfully live they were then, but they really were. And and they had this beautiful, and lyrically, it's it's quite an interesting lyrical album. It's very first person. It's very, the, the protagonists are all mainly in the first person. But it's, and then, you know, tracks like Just were very unusual at the time. You know, there were many songs that say you do it to yourself and that's what really hurts. Or, mm. you know, that. that and and then there was this these videos that got made with, with nothing to do with me. Obviously, I was just went in and played the violins and then went off again. And they shared the music with me, which was very kind of them. And so I felt very involved. But but it's got this very powerful guitar thing going on. You're starting to hear harmonic harmonically experimental things going on from Johnny and Tom. That they they, they beautiful voice. This this the really this floatingly beautiful and the falsetto and non falsetto voice which is incredibly emotional what was the work for like when I, sorry I'm, i interrupted you no oh, i know no sorry go ahead what was the work for like when the tables were turned but when tom was remixing your music how did that work oh that was really exciting um so so that that record was was um, made with nick ryan so nick ryan was a friend of mine he had produced my first record. Um, so I produced my, I wrote my first record, which was called Small Town Shining, which was with the musicians on that album were, were, were in a band with me and all the way through the 1990s. I wasn't the singer in that band, but I was guitarist and co-songwriter. Mm-hmm. And I wrote a bunch of songs on my own and I wanted to voice my, my sing myself. And actually Tom, Tom produced my first demo. No way. So he, really? Yeah. So after the OK Computer tour, he had some time. And he was living in Cornwall at the time. And he just bought a new studio. And it was just a little box. It was one of the, I can't remember what you call them now, but it's like a, an eight track. And he wanted to know how to use it. And he said, look, I want to learn how to be a producer. Mm-hmm. And I like your songs. Why don't you come up for a few days? So I went up for about four days. Um, and we just hung out. And he recorded me, these, these demos. So I think we recorded four tracks. And then... Um, and then I did another demo with Nick. So Nick was working as an artist under the name Silver Kick at the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm recording one of my songs. So I did lots of that swapping. Mm-hmm. So I swapped strings in order to record my own songs. And then those demos were then used as a, as a, as a sort of a template for my first record. Which So someone got to play them to Matthew Herbert. Um, Matthew Herbert, I found out, was forming a new label called Accidental. And my release was one of the first releases on that on that label. Um, and Nick produced that most of the songs on that record. It was produced in a very. It was made. Firstly, me and my band went to this disused 
place in Portland Square, tower in Portland Square in Bristol and jammed there for a couple of days. It didn't even have its own electricity. We had to, the, the, the person who was running that studio, which is a musician now called John Wigans, who writes a lot for TV, um, writes a lot for grand designs and things like that. He, I think the, the electricity was stolen from a nearby, wow. nearby building or something like that. Brilliant. It was really... It was cold. It had no heating. No heating. And um, oh my god, I'd die. No, no. But we just and we just played and played and played. Wow. And we recorded it onto an ADAT, and and everything was on this kind of big tape, this ADAT cassette that was my record. And then I took it to Nick in Stuart Newington, and then he had this ADAT thing. And oh, brilliant! Um, but one of the one of the tracks and one this. of the tracks on that was recorded in this session with Tom. So the track "Talk to Me" was was recorded by Tom in Cornwall, and. That's him playing the keyboard at the end. So the organ at the end is Tom. And and he gave me a lot of confidence to sing. Mm-hmm. Basically, said, you can sing, you've got your own voice, just be yourself. Beautiful. So after that record was made, a few years later, I, um, long, long story, personal, personally, but I had um, a son and a daughter and needed to work. And, so, and I ended up getting a job at Plymouth University mm-hmm. as a lecturer in sonic arts. And part of that afforded the kind of back, Back interest in the physics thing, because, I, because research was part of what I needed to do apart from that job, so it's also contextual, and I was still interested in using physics as part of thinking about music. I have audience questions, says John. Would you like to address them? Yeah, of course, yeah. I'll just read these questions out. I have four, and you can choose to answer the ones you want to address. How does that sound? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, uh, do we need to get a music degree? That's one. Uh, do we need conservatory education? That's another one. Uh, this one's really interesting. During the earlier parts of your career, when you were um, trading uh, recordings with Tom, were there barter deals or were there finances involved? And how do you feel about barter deals amidst musicians who know each other well? Uh, and uh, fourth question is, do we have to be signed to a label in order to be successful? So I can I can answer all of those if you like. Yeah, I have time. No, you don't need a music degree. It depends what you want to do. Mm-hmm. You don't need a music degree in order to be a musician. You can just be a musician. But but I think that having a degree helps people in lots of different ways. It helps you think critically. It helps you think critically about music. It can lead to things, other things in terms of your your working life. Mm-hmm. It can open doors in working lives. Um, you don't. No, you don't have to have a label. I don't think. I think especially now, mm-hmm. you don't have to have a label. I agree. But sometimes having a label can help, and it depends on. It really depends on the context. It depends on who the label is, who they know, whether they understand you, how much time they're going to put into you, mm-hmm. all those kinds of things. Um, what was the second question? Barter deals amidst musicians while working, while collaborating. Yeah, um, I, I've done a lot of that. Mm-hmm. In answer to the, the economic question, that there was no money changed hands at all. Um, it, it was for the session on the band. Um, I think this is a great topic to address because I do a lot of that too. I collaborate with a lot of musicians without necessarily paying each other. And there is a certain demographic who seems to find that a very a questionable practice. Personally, I think the idea of collaborating with our co-artists and then investing in a musical work or a project, which we then... Well, I do it all the time. Exactly. Yeah. I do it all the time. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's just an exchange. You're, I mean, it's just an exchange without money. I mean, I don't think necessarily need money in order to exchange things with other people. I agree. Money, money is is only a, a signifier of exchange anyway, isn't it, by definition? So there are lots of other ways of exchanging things. When do you think the exchange gets critical? Where do we need to be careful and cautious? That's a good question. I think if you think you're being exploited or if you think that there's something unequal in it, then you have to ask yourself why you're doing it, why you're still involved in this relationship if it's unequal. Mm-hmm. It takes a certain amount of maturity and experience to be able to do that sometimes. Brilliant. Love that answer. And the last question was, do we need a conservatory training to be a professional musician? I'm not going to judge that question. I'll just put it across to you the way I hear it. Well, I think it depends. I think, again, it depends on what kind of musician you want to be. Um, mm. I haven't got a conservatory tra- training, but Declan Day has, who I spoke about earlier, and he has got a lot of, out of conservatory training. And he play, if you want to play in a professional orchestra, you probably need a conservatory training because it teaches you how to play in a certain way. And I'm talking about the London Symphony Orchestra or the Berlin Philharmonic or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and so on. But I think if you don't want to go down that route, no, you don't need a conservatory training. But there are it's a particular kind of education. 
and it works for some not for others yeah this hits especially hard for me in germany there's there are like two separate categories like uh, for your royalties the you know classical musicians get paid higher royalties than non classical or non jazz musicians get yeah i mean i, I don't agree with me that. neither that's, that's, i i that's really that. have my issues with that uh, which is why i'm still not registered in germany my pro is still in the us which anyway that's a whole different story did i interrupt you yeah that seems, that seems to be about that's about something else though isn't it that's yeah. about power it's, it's nothing to do with music Yeah, you think so? Do you have a minute to elaborate on that? I like the sound of that. That makes somebody eligible and somebody not. Mm. It's usually nothing to do with the actual thing that people do. It's to do with being in a certain club or, or keeping people out, mm. you know. So I imagine that that's there because a bunch of people who have classical training go, yeah, well, we don't want these non-classical trained people in. So yep. let's, pay our, let's pay us classical chaps a lot more money to, to make sure that people stay in our club and don't go in that other club. Sounds about right. Yeah, I wish I could disagree with you. Usually, what happens is there ends up being a rebellion or a fight or a or a, or a court case that stops that thing happening, and then and then that will get equaled out until the next lot of power comes along. Mm. The next the next power inequality comes along. I want to respect your time, John. Okay, yeah, I need to go now. Yes. Anyway, but thanks very much. No, that was really enjoyable. Right back at you. It's so so good to have seen you again, and I will be in touch with. Um, regarding the release of this and everything and generally as well and always a pleasure and always an honor sir all right thank you very much lovely to see you too. okay john you have a great day see you bye-bye gratitude from the bottom of my heart for listening to the very end please consider taking a minute to subscribe to our show so you know when the next episode is out this is a labor of love one i hope snowballs into one that's sustainable in its attempt to support independent thought and authentic relating. And having you as a regular member of our audience is what makes that a realistic prospect. Much love and talk soon. Just another voice out in the 